by gosh, if he doesn't co- uh, concede on election night, he's a usurper. Uh, we let's talk to this general. And if if the president illegally usurped office, would you be prepared to remove him? Like that kind of really dangerous conversation. Understanding the way that that was set up, understanding that is false, and um, you know, being prepared for the media attempting to push that narrative and being prepared to push counter narrative to that. We are less than 24 hours away from Election Day 2020, on which the American people will hypothetically and hopefully be able to choose between incumbent President Donald J. Trump and his opponent, former Vice President Joe Biden. And I say that because there is a very clear plan at work, which is being orchestrated and enacted by the various apparatuses in this country that are totally corrupt and that are totally against the American people, and then by extension, totally against President Trump. And this is not a conspiracy theory. This is all publicly available information, and we will get into all of that with our guest today, Dr. Darren J. Beatty, who is a former official in President Trump's White House, as well as one of the few authentically conservative academics in the country, and actually the only academic to correctly predict Donald Trump's victory in 2016 while he was a member of the faculty at Duke University. He's also doing great work over at Revolver.News, which is the new and quite frankly much better alternative to the Drudge Report, which has fallen off from its founding ethos to a large extent. And so I would advise you all to listen very carefully to Dr. Beatty to watch this in its entirety, pause it and come back if you have to, because if there is a way to take our country back and to get it on the right track, I can promise you that Dr. Beatty is going to be one of the key architects in that. Very high IQ, Not high energy in the traditional sense, maybe not dragon energy, more like maybe owl energy, right? Much more calculated, much more cunning, and unequivocally, one of the most intelligent and impactful figures that we have on the right. And because of that, I'm going to let him go off and do the majority of the talking because this audience a very intelligent audience, and even one of the more intelligent audiences within what's considered to be online conservative media. And I know that you'll really enjoy sinking your teeth into these ideas, so do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. We are here now with Dr. Darren J. Beatty. He's going to share with us his insight into the color revolution, the 2020 election, and what happens going forward, particularly with the future of American conservatism. So we will bring him in now. Dr. Beatty, how are you this morning? I'm great. Great to be here. Excellent, of course. Very excited to have you. So I guess before we get started with the color revolution, which I know is something that you've been pushing uh, very recently on programs such as Tucker Carlson, I kind of wanted to get a background as to, to what you're doing, what you're about, where you came from. I know that you were actually the only academic at Duke University, correct me if I'm wrong, to predict President Trump's victory in 2016. I was wondering kind of what led you to that conclusion and why everybody else got it wrong. Yes. In fact, given that we're in election season now, it's somewhat nostalgic for me thinking back four years or so when I was a professor at Duke University. I had already kind of gained some notoriety as being the only non-tenured full-time academic in the country to have publicly supported President Trump. And you can imagine the environment and reception that I would have got for that as a as a professor at Duke, mm-hmm. there happened to be a panel with my my colleagues. Um, the panel was really to discuss the election, but also to make some predictions. And I was the only person on that panel who uh, correctly predicted the outcome, which is that Trump would win. And I was the only person in the university who endorsed Trump. So it was kind of it's a good way to distinguish oneself. And it happened to be that I was right. So that was an added advantage. But it wasn't just some kind of fluke out of nowhere. In fact, um, prior to that teaching year, I was in Germany, actually. And there was a um, standard course at Duke called Left, Right and Center. Basically, the syllabus is designed to give students sort of a comprehensive view of various political ideologies, foundational texts shaping those ideologies, and um, with a view toward kind of giving them a deeper sort of informative base from which to critically engage day-to-day politics. And one of my kind of I don't know, claim to fame, I'm, I'm proud of it, is that I totally reformulated that syllabus in order to reflect a thesis I had, which was that the political coalitions, both in the left and the right, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, were kind of obsolete at that point. And the very thesis of that syllabus 
was vindicated in real time with the emergence of Trump on the Republican side and Bernie on the Democrat side. And there are all kinds of questions that now might seem a little bit too like eggheady or wonkish or even commonsensical at this point. But back then it was really something to point out, look, we have these political ideologies that package together different positions. For instance, you have a position on abortion, you have a position on tax policy, you have a position on foreign policy. And there are really three options, you know, in terms of how those all cohere. Um, one option is that they're entirely arbitrarily bunched together. The other option is that there's some kind of underlying coherence whereby if one has a position on abortion, one must necessarily have a position about the ideal tax rate and so forth. And then the third option, which I basically subscribe to, is that the coherence was there, but it was circumstantial and it emerged out of a certain time period in the Reagan era and so forth, which is really those underlying circumstances that gave coherence to that particular, quote unquote, movement conservative framework. Those circumstances of coherence were eroding and that was ripe for, you know, condition for the emergence of someone like Donald Trump, who so effectively and justifiably challenged all of those orthodoxies. Yeah, that's something that we actually talked about in the last video, I think we posted sort of how Donald Trump seems to have taken the moral positions from both parties, uh, be it with the Democrats, the anti-war position being right. for the working man, and then the moral positions from the Republican Party, like you mentioned, with low taxes and pro-life. And right. he's literally like, push these together to make the new Republican platform. And he's effectively forced them to capitulate to that. And that's why his base is so excited. That's why you have a lot of Democrats, more traditional, you know, maybe Bill Clinton Democrats coming over for Donald Trump. Um, and that was something I actually I got in trouble for. I said that uh, in 1992, I probably would have voted for Bill Clinton over George H.W. If, if I had the choice because of things uh, you like should have voted for Ross Perot. Well, actually, I would have voted for Pat Buchanan if I actually. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I alluded to that. I said, you know, there were a former communications director that we're running. I maybe would have cast my, my ballot for him. But uh, that's another thing that interests me about you is that you have a background in, in mathematics and, and yes. philosophy, and that sort of influenced your politics. So I was wondering if you could kind of go into to how that, that happened. I know that your family, I think I saw you've said, is filled with mathematicians. And are you the only political figure uh, emerging from your family? Uh, yes, I am the only political figure. I um, and yeah, it's it's kind of it's been an odd trajectory. Um, a lot of my family, as you mentioned, is mathematicians. Is kind of what I was cultivated to do. It's where a lot of my talents were, and um, you know, it's still very important to me. And it kind of exists in terms of, you know, I think mathematics is really, you know, it's about a lot of things. I'm not going to pretend like it transposes exactly, but a lot of mathematics is about thinking in terms of structure. And, you know, it's the same kind of kind of attention to structure that could lead me to, say, make an observation about, oh, how do these political ideologies cohere? You know, what's what's this, you know, the network structures of kind of the American ruling class? Like, how do things fit together? What are the patterns that you can see? Like that basic framework of thinking, I think, is very compatible with with mathematics. But of course, there are many differences as well. So. It just happened to be that that was something I liked and was fairly good at. That's interesting. And the big thing that you've been you've been talking about recently is the color revolution. I know that this has been on Revolver. This has been on Fox News, as we said. So I was wondering if you could give a very brief summary of that before we really dive in and start to pick it apart. Right. So the brief summary is basically this. And, you know, I, I feel almost repetitive saying it, but I think it's important to say it because there are probably a lot of people who haven't heard it. And that is that, you know, we've all gotten a sense since the basically day one of Trump's presidency, in many cases, even earlier, because a lot of these shenanigans began during the campaign, as we've learned, that there's some kind of coup being enacted against the president. And I think that's correct. The only issue is the term coup is maybe a little bit too general. And what I've adduced on um, revolver.news, uh, which is like the new Drudge Report, investigative reporting, president has endorsed it, everyone should check it out. But there's a series of articles that I promoted 
uh, this color revolution thesis in. And the thesis is basically this, that there's a coup against the president, but it's a very specific type of coup. It's known as a color revolution regime change model. And it's a model favored by certain elements within the American national security apparatus and typically deployed against Eastern European countries, as opposed to just this incredibly brutal, overt, send troops in, remove the dictator type model that we saw in Iraq that, of course, you know, works so well. We have this alternative model, this color revolution model that's kind of more subtle, tricky. It involves much, uh, a much more kind of broad, a, a broader application of information warfare. And its two chief characteristics are, number one, and this will you know, be striking, I think, to those in your audience who haven't heard this. The first characteristic is an engineered contested election scenario. And the second characteristic is massive mobilized protests, quote unquote, peaceful protests, which are used by color revolution professionals as a term of art. This is a term of craft. Peaceful protests, quote unquote, does not come out of nowhere. It is a standard piece of vocabulary used by color revolution professionals. So quote unquote, peaceful protests, civil disobedience, mass mobilization, combined with these contested election scenarios. Now, that of course sounds very familiar to anyone who's remotely been paying attention to our politics in the United States for the past several months. But where the color revolution thesis really gets powerful and actually subversive is when one recognizes that it's not just the same playbook, the same tactics and strategies used against Trump and Trump supporters domestically that our national security apparatus is used in Eastern Europe. It's literally the same people, the same networks. And so part of the advantage of identifying color revolution beyond its sort of uh, theoretical uh, specificity as to what's going on is that unlike a term coup, when you use the term color revolution, it automatically implicates a very specific network of actors within our broader national security apparatus. And I called out one of those actors on Tucker Carlson, Norm Eisen, but there are many of them. George Kent, it's uh, an Atlanticist faction of the American power structure that's uh, chiefly concerned with Europe and energy politics. We can get into all of it. But what's most dangerous about this is that it really underscores a development that I would love to discuss further with you. And I think everyone should be attentive to it. And that is, we're so used to formulating all of the issues we care about in the bread and circuses of left versus right, Republican versus Democrat. And there is a lot of that. I mean, partisan politics is, is a reality, but you lose so much to filter everything into those categories. And this color revolution uh, issue, you see that broader swaths of America's national security apparatus are actually being repurposed and redeployed domestically in order to silence, censor, and destroy the energies associated with the victory of Donald Trump. Um, so I was going to ask, I've seen some of the criticism of this thesis and researching it myself, and a lot of the people that you've called out specifically have denied it. Um, some of the other people on the sidelines have chimed in to say that you categorically misunderstand what a color revolution is, and so therefore applying it to this scenario is just incorrect. So I was wondering if, because people in this audience, this is the first time, like you said, that they're probably hearing about this. So what right. is a color revolution within the context of Eastern Europe, and then how does that more specifically apply to, to what we're doing right now? Like, why why, why did you decide to call it a color revolution? Well, I mean, I decided to call it a color revolution precisely because I noticed those two characteristics, namely contest election scenario and massive mobilized protests, was exactly the framework being deployed here. And then when you notice that it's the very same people who are used to running these operations, literally the same people. If you look at the um, star impeachment witnesses against Trump, You'll notice a pattern that otherwise would seem very curious. Why are all of these key impeachment witnesses, these key figures against Trump trying to remove him from office? Why is it the case that they all or almost all have or have had diplomatic or bureaucratic posts related to Eastern Europe? 
That's a very bizarre coincidence. And the color revolution thesis has such explanatory power. One of the things it explains is that's why is that these were the people who are used to running, you know, there was their job to run these color revolutions overseas through, you know, a nexus of NGOs, friendly media associated with these NGOs, engineered protests, engineered contest election scenario. They have the playbook. And they're running the same playbook. In fact, the guy that I met that I called out on Tucker is a perfect embodiment of this thesis. His name is Norm Eisen. He's one of the key architects of nearly every effort to censor, undermine, impeach, overthrow the president. He drafted 10 articles of impeachment before the president's phone call with Zelensky was even made. He's been behind over 100 lawsuits against the Trump administration. He wrote a book a how-to book on how to uh, implement a color revolution overseas. And here's the kicker. His book is actually called The Playbook. It's literally called The Playbook, and it outlines how to implement color revolution overseas, and it has such advice as you know, mass demonstrations, mass protests, impeachment, scenarios if you can and he's been deeply involved in the impeachment against trump again before there was even the pretext that he ultimately used um uh find contested election scenario find ways to contest the election so as to drum up pretext to have more uh demonstration civil disobedience try to encourage a quote-unquote authoritarian backlash to your acts of civil disobedience can that can then be used to reinforce the frame of your target leader as an authoritarian and therefore enhance the protests against him. And, you know, the, the pushback to my thesis is actually really interesting along a number of dimensions. And here's another kind of general point that I think is important to your audience and that underscores the effectiveness of calling it more specifically what it is as a color revolution versus the general term of coup that we had seen previously. And not only is it a more accurate term, but as I mentioned, it implicates a very specific network of people. And what's so effective, what we need to really internalize is people, you know, whether on the right, whether we call ourselves on the right, conservatives, populists, patriots, just people who you know, have the gall to step outside of the, um, you know, American corrupt ruling class narratives that they shove down our throats, however you want to formulate it. Um, our side needs to stop focusing exclusively on ideas and learn how to attach a name and a face to a problem, because that's what's so effective. What's what's driven these people crazy is that I've called out a specific network and specific people and names, and they simply can't handle that because they're not used to it. And I think that's generally a much more effective approach to whether you want to call it activism or politics or whatever, instead of just generalizing, oh, here's the theoretical problem. When you attach a name and a face to it, it becomes orders of magnitude more effective. And all the people coming out of the woodwork going apoplectic over the fact that they were called out. I could go over them one one by one. One of the guys, you know, it's such an incestuous group. They all cite each other. They're all part of the same cluster. <laughs> There's this organization called NewsGuard, this completely fake and ridiculous um, uh, organization that purports to give news sites, quote unquote, nutrition labels, because we all know how consistent our nutritionists are. They never change their minds. We know how accurate that is. So they give nutrition labels to news sites. They purport to be this great bipartisan objective source to make sure they're protecting you from misinformation, disinformation. Go ahead and look at the board of this group. It's all these national security state color revolution types, you know, and they say they're bipartisan, which is actually true. And what people don't understand is you know, a debate between Hillary Clinton and the late John McCain is technically bipartisan, but it's certainly not balanced in relation to our political environment. The swamp is bipartisan. The corrupt ruling class is bipartisan. That's part of how it's all structured. And so for them to say, oh, we're bipartisan because we have 
Tom Ridge, you know, the first head of Homeland Security who recently endorsed Biden <laughs> as our representative for the Republicans. And we have like all of these Obama national security people on the other side is ridiculous, but it's not just ridiculous. It's part of this new framework they have to use national security terminology and language like misinformation, disinformation, which achieves two objectives. For one, it brings the eye of the national security apparatus to bear on domestic political disputes, which is extremely dangerous. And secondly, it's parasitic off of this idea that in theory should be true, that national security exists on a higher, more important, and more objective plane than domestic politics. So by invoking the language of national security and calling this not just partisan material that they disagree with, but disinformation, or even worse, Russian disinformation, they all of a sudden put it into this national security context that is extremely dangerous for our politics. What is it about Donald Trump that you think has caused them to react like this? Because I don't think that they would ever do anything like this with uh, with a Marco Rubio or even uh, Hillary Clinton or uh, a Joe Biden. What is it about Donald Trump that poses such a threat to the establishment and the ruling class? Right. Well, that's a great question. And, you know, a go to answer to that would be, you know, to um, describe various policies that he's advocated, certain agenda items that he's advocated. And, you know, that would be true to some extent. You know, he's uh, one of the great uh, events, maybe the greatest moment of his 2016 campaign was not any of the locker up Hillary, all this, you know, all the Hillary <laughs> stuff was great. Don't get me wrong. Hillary stuff was great. The Rosie O'Donnell stuff was inspired. But Despite all of those greatest hits, I think actually from a substantive point of view um, and from the point of view of where the politics is in our country, the most important event of that campaign was when Donald Trump stood on the debate stage in South Carolina before an audience that all of the neoconservatives assured us, this is, this is Bush country, this is neocon country. You don't understand the people of South Carolina, says Bill Crystal. So, like he's Bill Crystal, so resonant with the spirit of South Carolina <laughs> to say that. He said, "You don't understand these South Carolina." I'm Bill Crystal. I understand the South Carolinians. Let me tell you, they're going to boo Trump off the stage if he dares to criticize my beloved Iraq War because it was so good for them, right? And Donald Trump, just like it was one of the most unshackled moments in American political history. He gets there. He rips Jeb's face off. I felt sorry for Jeb. I hoped that his mom was in the audience to comfort him after because he was so abjectly humiliated and deservedly so. But it wasn't just for the, you know, the, the pleasure of humiliating somebody like Jeb. It was to underscore a very important point that just because we're on the right, just because we're conservatives, just because we're patriots, just because we love our military and our troops and everyone that you know makes all of those incredible sacrifices for the safety of our country, doesn't mean we just nod our heads and approve of something like the Iraq war that's been devastating both for our national security and for our troops who put themselves on the line for this because corrupt leaders told them to. And, 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 and Donald Trump called that out. And, in, and, and, you know, I, it'll shock people to know that Bill Crystal, this, just this one time turned out to be wrong. <laughs> just this one time, Bill Crystal turned out to be wrong as to what the reception would be. And it was an overwhelming re reception. And you know what, if Donald Trump hadn't done that, the Republicans party would still be in this weird stage where everyone knows that the Iraq war is a disaster, but nobody really had the guts to admit it. He just totally broke that seal and made it possible for the Republican party to be, you know, I, I don't like to even to like to say anti-war because sometimes a war would be justified, anti-unnecessary war, anti-war yeah. for special interests and not wars that are the last resort and that are only oriented toward putting the interests and safety of the American people first. Yeah. The wars for liberalism, the wars right. for liberalism. Um, right. 
I think that we're going to get pretty quickly into sort of the, the trajectory of the GOP and conservatism in America. So I, I wanted to ask you to illustrate three scenarios uh, pertaining to the color revolution, what you think their best case scenario would be, what they would like to achieve, uh, what you right. think our best case scenario would be in combating it, and then what you think realistically is going to happen. Right. Well, look, this this is a kind of multifaceted problem. And again, you're we're in a reality that we can't change and we just have to deal with what we are and, and optimize it. Ideally, um, the administration would have been more conscientious in putting loyal people and patriots within the ranks of the bureaucracies that are relevant to stopping the color revolution. One thing that I've been a little bit frustrated with, um, and I don't think I'm the only one, is you know the kind of um, uninspiring action on the part of, for instance, the Department of Justice in dealing with the Antifa riots and all these other things. It's like, you know, I've, you know, Revolver.News has written about this extensively, and that is that if you wanted to stop, it's not that the DOJ is weak. We've seen that the DOJ can be absolutely brutal for people it actually wants to destroy. For instance, Julian Assange. It's just that for whatever reason, they're very reluctant to give the Julian Assange treatment to the top organizers and financers. Why do you think that is? I was at, I was at the Trump rally yesterday, and uh, you know he's up on the microphone, and he said something to that effect. He said, "You know, where's the Department of Justice for the Antifa people?" And, right. and was kind of, everyone was cheering, and I was like, right. "That's his Department of Justice." Right. I know it is. It is kind of remarkable. Look, I I love President Trump. I I hope he wins. I wish him all the best. But it, it is remarkable to see. The president of the United States, who is the nominal, at least head of the executive branch, complaining about these things, just like we would complain about yeah. it. But, you know, you're you're technically the head of the executive branch, but I, I think this gets to a, you know a real problem, and I don't want people to kind of take it the wrong way because I don't mean it as like a jab or as a criticism, but and this is related to you know the coup, the color revolution, is so that. President Trump is not um, a president in the ordinary sense of having full command and control over the executive apparatus. For instance, the sense in which President Trump is president is a very different sense in which, for instance, FDR was president, who was able to completely reshape the executive according to his image give top-down commands. And I think that's an issue that's a multi-dimensional issue. It's not all or even principally Trump's fault. This is a problem going back decades and developing over decades. But the reality is, and the same applies, for instance, to Bill Barr. So I could criticize Bill Barr and say, look, man, you got to get tougher. You, you can't be squeamish about this, which frankly, I think he is on a personal level. But even if he weren't squeamish, like even if we had the guy prepared to do what it takes at DOJ, if you don't have the DOJ rank and file more or less on your side, you can't get anything done. It's just not going to happen. They're going to sabotage you at every step. They're going to leak against you. They're going to just make it impossible for you to get anything done. And then they're going to leave you hanging to dry. And then, God forbid, if Trump loses, someone like Bill Barr, if he actually tried to crush Antifa, would get the Roger Stone treatment times 100. So that's kind of the, the thinking going on in his head is that, you know, even if he wanted to, you couldn't fully mobilize the DOJ to do what they need to do. And that's an institutional problem. And that's why I'm saying like best case scenario with respect to these color revolutions, like from day one, you have extremely knowledgeable people with respect to each bureaucracy. You put them in there and say, you know, clear out as many people as you can, bring in as many, and that could take years, could take three years. But if they had started it from day one, there would be a much better chance of, for instance, Barr, if he were willing to be able to activate the DOJ, for instance, or to activate the other organizations like the FBI. But now it's like, it's kind of too little too late. So then the question is, you know, what 
what can we do now? What do they have in store? Well, one element of the color revolution, as I mentioned, is massive mobilized protests. And you already see all of these umbrella groups, not all associated with Soros, but a lot of them. And by the way, this thing about Soros, I want to say is that, yes, you know, he's definitely kind of a nefarious actor involved in a lot of these things. But and this is to his credit, I think I'm kind of in a way, and this will sound horrible, an admirer of Soros because I want a Soros on our side. I want someone who deploys the same kind of ruthlessness, the same kind of dedication, the same kind of playing for keeps mentality on our side that they have on their side with George Soros. And what I see on the right, and I've talked about this with many people, is it's very, it's so frustrating, but we have to be very sober about it, especially going forward, is it's like with precious few exceptions, it's either, it's one, at least one of the following three categories, stupid, corrupt, weak, stupid, corrupt, weak. And you can't win with any of those. You can't win. If you just have one of those, you're not going to be effective. And it seems like that's the law of the land on our side. And that's why we're constantly playing catch up. But somebody like George Soros, um, who has been very effective in building up entire institutions that mostly function on autopilot right now, it's not like you have this you know, almost 90 year old guy micromanaging every single thing. He's created an infrastructure that's working on autopilot that has all of these various umbrella organizations that just funnel money into these active activist groups. And what they've had through, you know, color of change, move on all these organizations, they have hundreds of thousands of people teed up to rush the nation's capital in this intermediate period between election and inauguration. And that's going to happen in conjunction with, you know, disputed ballot issues. You're going to take the, they're taking the fight to the courts. They're going to flood the streets. There's going to be a converged media narrative. They're going to do all this full court press designed to push Trump out and to apply, to use a term, maximum pressure on Trump to concede as soon as possible, even if he shouldn't concede, even if it's you know, possible, oh, you know, we haven't counted the right ballots or, oh, they're counting bad ballots. They're pressuring him to concede. And what you see in all the media stories about this is pre-framing Trump not conceding on election night, no matter what the circumstances, as him behaving like some dictator that needs to be removed by force through military, through James Mattis riding there on a horse and removing him. That's that's the that's the kind of scenario that they're talking. Oh, Hillary Clinton says, Joe Biden, under no circumstances, succeed, uh, concede. And they're saying if Trump doesn't concede, like the second after, you know, you know, midnight on election night, he's illegitimate usurper and should be removed by any means necessary. And they have the boots on the ground, so to speak, in D.C. that's going to put pressure. They have the court files ready. They have their lawfare ready. So it's going to be in the streets and in the courts because they can't win necessarily in the ballot box. So they take it to the streets and the courts. Yeah, that's something that I really admire about the work you do. I know we talked about this earlier, but you get on television, like Tucker Carlson, for example, with 4 million viewers, and you call these people out by name. And a lot of times what we see on the right, uh, we, like you said, with the the fixation on principles and, and the abstract rather than like actually putting right. names and faces on these ideas. And I think that, you know, that's the the classic my principles meme of principles but really what it comes down to is playing for keeps and i think oftentimes that that fixation on principles is really just a coping mechanism for being too unintelligent to actually do anything being too weak to actually do anything or to sort of masquerade your own corruption so i think you really hit the nail on the head with those three so what do you think that's uh realistically is going to happen going forward like you said with, with tuesday uh, in, in the election, and and do you think that Trump is in a position where he can avoid that simply by the energy in his base, or do you think it's going to be close enough to where they could actually attempt something like that with with a high degree of success? That's that's difficult to say. I don't know if it would be the base that can. You know, I I I've said before that if the left, if these Soros umbrella groups are planning sort of flooding the nation's capital with with people, 
to put pressure and to create a propaganda effect. Typically what you see in these color revolutions is they have these artificial mass protests. They're all engineered by, you know, these NGO type groups and they flood the capital, they flood, you know, the leader's palace or whatever location that they want to overwhelm. And what they want is the optics of, you know, police officers going after them because they want to create an optical situation of, oh, look at all of these people who just organically have come to protest this illegitimate leader and look at all of these big, bad um, police officers and authority uh, figures cracking down on them. And so I think it actually is important to the degree possible and, and to agree that it's safe to have Trump supporters there to serve as this countervailing force to that optics narrative. To the extent to which that's possible, I don't know, but I think it would be good to see if it could be done, if it could be done safely. It really all depends on how the votes are looking. They did a war game on the election. They, meaning you know, basically these color revolution operatives, they wrote about it in uh, Boston newspaper, New York Times covered it. And they conveniently concluded that the only scenario in which this country can avoid mass chaos and violence would be a landslide victory for Biden. Now, one on one hand, one could interpret that as a prognostication or a prediction. On the other hand, one could interpret that as a threat, right? Uh, but either way, they're saying, unless it's a landslide for Biden, if it looks like it could go to Trump, we're off to the races. We're flooding the streets. We're going wild. This is, they're not going to take this lying down. They're not going to concede. They say, look, if it looks like it's for Trump, we are going to fight tooth and nail in the courts. We're going to fight in the streets. We're going to use our you know, almost like converged sympathy of every single media institution, except for sometimes Fox News. So it's going to be this full court press precisely of the sort you see done by uh, NGOs in color revolution scenarios, for instance, in Belarus. Now, one thing I'd like to say, just kind of a caveat or qualification, is that I've gotten some criticism from people who object to the color revolution thesis because they think what I'm doing is somehow justifying or defending every single leader in Eastern Europe who's been <laughs> attacked by color revolution. And really, you know, you got to look at that on a case by case basis that gets into a critique of, first of all, like American foreign policy, American strategic objectives, and also the blowback that you get from this color revolution methodology, which is a very interesting discussion, but it's not what I'm talking about here. I'm remaining neutral in this respect in relation to whether I think it's good what, you know, the color revolution that we're kind of facilitating in Belarus or what we did in Ukraine, all these other countries, that's irrelevant to the thesis. What's relevant to the thesis is it's the same people who are running those operations are running the same type of operation domestically. And that's what's dangerous is when they use national security tools against the American population domestically. And that's that's the objection here. It's not, you know, a positive or negative claim about any specific color revolution, but I do think it is interesting that given that I mentioned Belarus, where, where there is this color revolution, you can call it something else, but it's a combination of contested election scenario and massive protests with a lot of the same terminology and many of the same people attacking Trump talking about Belarus. In fact, the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, which is a color revolution organization associated with Norm Eisen, he's on the board, I believe. They've been talking about Belarus and they said, this is the ghost of democracy's future. Well, what are they talking about there? They're making the connection all but explicitly. And guess what? The person in the State Department running the Belarus desk this is pointed out on revolver.news, is none other than George Kent, star impeachment witness against the president. So make of that what you will. They've got uh, 
a very effective and well-established infrastructure through which they can they can mobilize these people for the mass demonstrations. Um, and I think a lot of that gets back to with George Soros and actors like that, you know, spending literally their entire lives to construct that infrastructure to where right. they can be sustaining on autopilot. I was wondering if you could get into literally the psychology of these people, because a lot of times it's hard to get people on the right to go out and protest. And, you know, we can tell ourselves, oh, it's because we're busy at work. Uh, but what right. they really want to do is, you know, get out there and maybe flip off the lib the liberals and, you know, have the MAGA hats on, but they won't go door knocking or, or phone banking. But even right. with these last minute, I, I, you see something on Twitter and all of a sudden you have a thousand people outside of a mayor's house or something. What do you think is, is different fundamentally with the psychology between a, a left-leaning person or a right-leaning person in the context of contemporary America to where they literally derive their, their raison d'etre from being involved with these movements and being a pawn in these, these broader movements? Well, that's, that's a great question. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, I guess there are multiple dimensions without getting, without getting too esoteric yeah. in the biochemistry that I know that we discussed one time. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question because on one hand, like I, I think the only way to describe a particular type of mobilization on the left, a particular type of activation on the left, is a kind of politicized and weaponized collective mental illness. You have a society that through various factors is no longer able, at least at scale, to give people the preconditions of a happy, stable, and flourishing life, whether that be, you know, family, enough, you know, money to start one's family, let alone to grow up in a good family, to get a house, to do all of these things, to find, you know, a stable uh, companion part, like all of these things, yes, they can happen if you're lucky, but there's not really the infrastructure in this country to support that at scale. And so a lot of people are you know, really missing something and they're bombarded constantly with uh, news and narratives that just feed into a kind of poisonous orientation of you know, who to blame for this. And so it's like society is set up to create collective mental illness and then the narratives are in place to channel and weaponize that mental illness politically. And I think that's chiefly what you see going on on the left. And um, it's what makes them kind of effective to some degree because they act as though they have less to lose. Um, they're willing to go the extra mile. Whereas, and so, so that's kind of, a formulation that's a little bit generous to the conservative side. Um, the other formulation that's a bit less generous is that conservatives or people on the right, however you want to put it, are really too addicted to comfort and are unwilling, as I'm saying, to do what it takes to play for keeps. As long as you can just eke out another year of a comfortable existence in a suburb somewhere or just move your house a little bit farther out to avoid the problem. Anything but to confront the problem is always kicking the can down the road, avoiding the problem because it's an ugly and inconvenient and even dangerous thing to deal with it. So keep kicking it down the road and it's reflected. And in another um, podcast, I kind of, did a deep dive into the different moral frameworks of the left and right and with a view toward their various effectiveness. And I pointed out that it's just a perfect juxtaposition between don't tread on me as a right wing motto and silence is violence as a left wing motto. Silence is violence. I'm sorry to say, look, I wish it weren't the case because this is not necessarily my personal orientation. I resonate more with you know, just let me live a good life. But I have to be objective about what, what works. And silence and violence will always defeat don't tread on me attitude. Because don't tread on me, it's just, just please leave me alone. Just leave me alone. Oh, if you come at me, I've, you know, I've got my gun, I'll get you. But leave me alone. Whereas silence is violence is 
Say Black Lives Matter or I'm burning down your business. Say it. Say the words. I don't care if you're some little old lady sitting around just minding your own business. Say the words. Because if you don't say the words, if you don't capitulate completely to my framework, you're committing violence against me. That's a very that's almost that's a terrorist attitude, but it's an attitude that's associated with playing for keeps in a way that, oh, just don't tread on me. Just, you know, just leave me alone. I, I'm just going to, uh oh, things are getting a little bit weird over here. I'm going to move my house a couple more miles away from all, <laughs> you know, that that's not a recipe for success ultimately. And so that's kind of at the um, population level in terms of attitudes at the operative level you know, I think that's really where it, 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 you know, the, the contrast is relevant and the left-wing operatives, the left-wing journalists, they want to change the world and they want to destroy their enemies. Conservative journalists basically just want a nice, comfortable life. Yeah. They're, they're, they're not playing for keeps. They're playing for think tank sinecures, journalists, sinecures, lobbying contracts, and maybe Fox News hits. They're not playing for all the marbles. And that's why they lose. It's just, you know, it's just common sense. If you don't play for keeps, you're not going to win. And so far, unfortunately, basically the right is not playing for keeps. Do you see something spawning or sprouting now that could act as sort of a, a a way for conservatives to take a, a rhetorical offensive um, akin to silence is violence, but of course not actually threatening to burn down the, the business of, of an old lady, but something like that, um, as opposed to the traditional don't tread on me, sort of leaving this this power vacuum and then hoping that everybody's just going to leave it there and not try to fill it with, with their agenda. Right. I, I do think so. And I think it can come from having a healthy and assertive moral framework. The moral framework of, for instance, um, a strong father in the household who means the best for everyone in it, but will enforce the rules of the household for the best interests of the household. That there's, you know, some ex behavior that's acceptable and there's some behavior that is absolutely not acceptable and willing to, you know, act with that kind of moral conviction. For instance, you see it with the riots. It's like, do you, do you know, it is, I know, you know, people will, resist this in some way, but there, there is this sense with a lot of conservatives internalized that the underlying core framework of the left is moral. It's just that they're going nuts with it. They're, 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 the underlying core is moral. They're just going nuts with it. And we are the responsible adults. But if you're responsible adults, you have the moral framework that sets the tone. You don't adopt your child's moral framework. And in this case, you see all the different ways in which the left's framework controls the right's thinking and rhetoric and strategy in all the ways that people on the right will bend over backwards to say we're not racist. They're, 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 they're more eager to prove that they're not racist than to prove they're not a killer, they're not a child molester. It's like they've accepted this idea that quote unquote racist, which is a term that the left has developed and weaponized for a specific purpose. They've accepted this idea that quote unquote racist or being accused of being a racist is the worst conceivable thing that could happen to you. And if you have that framework, you're going to be absolutely controlled. Even if you think, oh, the Antifa people are going too far. You know, don't don't the Antifa people know that that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and he was a Republican? Like, you know, these people, these Antifa people, you know, burning down cities, crushing things, saying death to America, if only they would learn that Abraham Lincoln, freer of the slaves, was a Republican. You know, this is just that that attitude that, oh yes, I agree with that moral framework. Let's have let's let's contest on the battlefield of who can best supplicate to the left's moral framework that the worst thing in the world is being called a racist. You're not going to win that. 
And it's totally irresponsible because it leads to things like Antifa, things like them burning down cities, and no one with the moral authority, even the maybe like patriarchal type authority in the symbolic sense, to say, look, this is not acceptable in my household. This is not acceptable in my country. Do you think that that stems back to, to a restoration of the family structure in sort of the um, I guess, epistemology of how we're interpreting these ideas, because I find that even when I talk to conservatives um, about things like Antifa or Black Lives Matter, their default response is always to address it intellectually. Like, well, don't they know that, uh, you know, police are actually 18 times more likely to be shot by a black man than they are to, to shoot a black man? And they they almost presuppose that if only these people could understand and read the same literature that they do, that all of a sudden they would just, oh, and then put down the bats and the, and the Molotov cocktails and go home. So what do you think it would take to kind of snap conservatives, frankly, out of that and get them to understand that this transcends facts and logic and really gets into the soul of the country? Right. Yeah, it's it's just a fundamental contradiction. Like you said, I think it's largely a cope because once you deal with the fact that what's going on is sub rational, it suggests playing for keeps approach that isn't, oh, let's Let's give them a reading packet that the Heritage Foundation put together 30 years ago. You know, <laughs> let's let's give them the Reagan. Let's give them a speech by Ed Meese. And, yeah, no, I've said that before. It's, uh, illegal immigration, these mass caravans, like like the conservatives that are advocating for that, because it'll theoretically reduce the price of orange juice. Like if only you know, when they pick up a tattered copy of On Liberty, and it just all <laughs> this is great. The NAP, of course, right. Right. I mean, that's it doesn't it just doesn't work. And and in many cases, people embody that contradiction in their own uh, description of events, like saying, do you think that, you know, Antifa and these other groups are behaving, you know, rationally? They say, well, not really. Well, how can then why would you address them rationally? You know, politics is you know, very rarely a kind of rational affair. It's mostly an issue of rationalization. And and that's the kind of interesting thing, even about conservatism and about the, the kind of how the ideology is packaged together is um, even that in many ways serves functionally as a kind of rationalization for various elements of the American power structure. You know, in, in the 80s and so forth, all of the kind of terminology about, you know, the free market and all these kind of stuff that, you know, conveniently elides important distinctions that, for instance, I, you know, uh, one of my uh, first articles was this piece in the National Review of all places that's understanding economic nationalism. And one of the take home lines from that piece is that the capitalism of Goldman Sachs is not the capitalism of the lemonade stand. And, you know, vocabulary that fails to appreciate this distinction is completely pernicious. And that, you know, you can use the same term, say, oh, you know, capitalism, Goldman Sachs, capitalism, all this big tech, capitalism, private sector. No, you're talking about completely different types of entities. You talk about, you know, in big investment banks, big corporations, um, big tech firms. It's and so to use the same vocabulary to shoehorn it into this prepackaged ideology also serves certain interests. So I think you know one really interesting thing to think about is just how things are layered, like how much of American politics at the retail level, so at, at the level of mass consumption, at the level of ideological consumption, and then a step above where I think things really matter is sort of intra-elite competition, um, there are these three layers of political activity. And most people don't understand that you know, the ideologies that they use and subscribe to, in many cases, those were engineered for purposes that are entirely different from what they would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's really interesting to see how the, the dissonance between people, especially with uh, with young women, I don't know how much time you spend talking with with young women on Twitter, but it's almost as though they, you know, those like memes where they'll say, you know, we showed a, a bot 
five episodes of Parks and Recreation, and then we had it right its own. It's the same thing when you talk to the, these people at these protests. I don't know if you've, if you've seen, but I go to a lot of these protests. Uh, right. It makes for good, like, gateway content. Right. Kind of right. And it's like that. You know, they'll, they'll recite the same focus group talking points that have been agreed upon, that if you did a search on Google, every article coincidentally has peaceful protests, peaceful, you know, even getting down to a very basic rhetorical level, like, oh, peaceful protest. It's an alliteration, so it sounds good. And they don't, they don't realize that. And they think that they actually are are the counterculture, uh, even though, right. you know, I've, literally every institution in the culture, all the corporations are on the side with them. But that's what I think. And that's something I've tried to communicate to my audience is that capitalism in itself um, is not inherently moral. If we can transcend you know, the sort of Prager you, well, it's moral because it's consent based. You know, if you like the politics of the lemonade stand, for example, right. um, I would be totally OK with that. I think that that's you know, perfectly fine. But when you get into things like you know, only fans or the referral program or distributing pornography, that theoretically is moral because it's consent based. But it's that consent based morality that is sort of hollowed out to society. Um, and it, it really is a subjective case for morality as opposed to the the objective case that I think we used to have 70 years ago. So what do you think we could do to, to go and about like this one point about that is like you're totally right. But like it it's almost even worse because it, aside from certain kind of um, you know, libertarian, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to use this certain adjective that usually goes with libertarian, but the libertarian types who are used to kind of hyper structured logical thinking that is not necessarily conducive to the realities of living as social beings in a social environment. Apart from those types of libertarians, you don't ha have a lot of people who really understand like, if it's truly an issue of consent based then consent presupposes agency, which in turn presupposes responsibility. So, but, so they don't even act as though it is a consent-based system because it's devoid of any accountability from the decisions made within that system. So it's really just a, a very overt mechanism of, of control that's framed as individual liberty. Yeah. Yeah, that, I, I sort of think of it like when a toddler has, like spills SpaghettiOs and makes it roughly into the shape of a giraffe or something and thinks that it's accomplished something. You know, if you want to pontificate in the abstract with all these different things and assume that you figured out something groundbreaking, even though like with what you said about agency, like do we really believe that the population as a whole is, is capable of agency, especially given the the mass media that is, is puppeteered from the top? So. How that applies to, to the election and going forward, I was curious to get your thoughts on, on what you think we'll be dealing with three days from now um, mm -hmm. with, with the mass protests and how you know, the President Trump will handle that and what the election results are going to be looking like. Yeah, well, um, again, I think, you know, it, it depends on how strong Trump is looking. The stronger Trump looks, I think the more chaos we get because... Um, the other side has been prepared for a very long time to battle this out in the streets and the courts if necessary, if they can't win it in the polls. That's their their color revolution is in many ways also their contingency plan. Look, it's possible that Biden actually just wins and and they don't even have to do the color revolution. But if Trump looks really strong, if it looks like he has a good chance they're going to pull out all the stops. They're going to, you know, they they have the mobilization in place to flood the zone, flood the nation's capital with possibly, you know, tens of thousands of people and, and protesters. And they also, you know, they have a very sophisticated legal strategy in place to make sure that, you know, no stone is left unturned in terms of making sure they can secure this election by any means necessary. So based on you know conversations that I've had with you know people who I think you know have good judgment and are not prone to hyperbole, um, this intermediate period between election night and inauguration day could be an extremely chaotic period for the country. Now it might not, and maybe even more likely that things just kind of, yeah, there are some flare ups, there are some protests, but ultimately it's nothing worse than what we've already seen, which is frankly pretty gruesome, but using that as a standard. But it's also possible that things get you know, unstable in a way that we really haven't seen in this country in a long time and that isn't really consistent 
with our self-conception of what America is to have this type of st- instability associated with a presidential election. Yeah, that was something that I actually tried to touch upon recently as well, that if you look at where the 2016 electorate sat um, graphically, the issues that polarize the country are, are much more issues of identity and, and social issues than they are issues of economics, which is what's troubling about the sort of fixation that the right has on economic issues. Maybe that's even because it's just the easiest to sort of combat. Like, I mean, it's a very logical and, and you can trace the thoughts and the evolution of them very clearly. Um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot with this, but for the average viewer watching, um, my audience tends to be on the younger side, but we do have some 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 Gen Xers and some some boomers. What can they do to, to help push back against this very, very practically, other than, of course, educate themselves and you know maybe share this video, share this podcast. Right. But what do you think they could do? do in relation to the election itself. Well, other than other than voting, but with the, the color revolution specifically, right. uh, if there's anything that they could do, whether that be, you know, going to these demonstrations safely and pushing back or uh, whatever. Right. Would- I say, you know, going going to the demonstrations safely, just understanding what's going on, understanding that the left has pre-framed this idea that if Trump doesn't concede immediately, he's somehow a usurper, understanding that that's the condition that they set up and on, you know, not buying it. They've, they've set up this framework for months now, this framework where, oh, we're worried that Trump is going to lose on election night and he's not going to concede. And by gosh, if he doesn't uh, concede on election night, he's a usurper. Uh, we let's talk to this general. And if if the president illegally usurped office, would you be prepared to remove him? Like that kind of really dangerous conversation. Understanding the way that that was set up, understanding that is false, and um, you know, being prepared for the media attempting to push that narrative and being prepared to push counter narrative to that. If that happens, God forbid, um, where do you see the future of of the American right? I've seen different polls that have come out with people flirting with uh, who the 2024 prospective nominees would be. And I, I can't tell you that I'm confident in, in that. Um, whether that be because of a Marco Rubio or even Ivanka Trump. I think that Ivanka Trump would actually be dangerous because she actually deviates from, from her, her dad's 2016 platform pretty substantially. And I think that that's one of Trump's biggest blind spots, maybe even the only blind spot, is that he's very loyal, perhaps to a fault, to his family, and he trusts their word almost invariably. Um, and so if that happens and Trump doesn't win legitimately or he is, is taken out via this color revolution, what do you see happening to sort of fill the vacuum of the American rights uh, and this sort of civil war that I think is inexorable between the Trump coalition and the people who want to re- return to business as usual and the sort of uh, George Bush, uh, Ted Cruz sense. Right. I think that's a, that's extremely important. We all have to be ready. Look, I'm cautiously optimistic about the election, but it's possible it doesn't go our way. This is the long game. You know, you, even if Trump gets a second term, Trump is just one phase. Trump's just phase one. You know, people like you are leading the charge for younger folks. You know, you guys are going to have to be at phase four. You know, I might be around, you know, phase three, but Trump is just one step. And so I think that's important to understand. He did tremendous amount. He shook things up. He created the preconditions for the subsequent phases that we have to successfully implement. And so that's irrespective of the outcome of the election. I think that, you know, you're right. We can look at particular figures and we can look at kind of particular camps and networks. The neoconservatives are actually very interesting here because, you know, I'm actually um, much less threatened by these overt never Trumpers like Bill Kristol. He's just kind of ridiculous. He is an operator. But, you know, there is something about him. It's like he's very overt about what he is like he's openly i'm against trump i'm working for biden i'm doing all these things and so in a way like he's irrelevant in that respect no one's ever going to think okay well because bill crystal endorsed someone you know he somehow has stature on the right i think it's much more dangerous for people who have more or less the same kind of agenda but are savvy enough or in a position to formulate it as the proper interpretation of 
what Trump represented. And, you know, Bill Crystal can't do that, but there are people like that. I think one, and I, you know, I don't know how you feel about it, but I happen to be not a huge fan of Nikki Haley. And I think Nikki Haley is somebody who is much more effective, much more dangerous than, you know, even someone like Liz Cheney, which frankly is ridiculous that a Cheney is even, you know, operating politics anyway. It's, it's an entirely disgraced name in American politics. And it's absurd to me that she has any place in it. She's angling for Speaker of the House. Let's really hope she doesn't get it because she is awful and she's everything her father is, but worse and even less charming. So she, she's really she's really bad. But but she has a ceiling like nobody is going to think of her as presidential material. She might be like secretary of defense in a Nikki Haley administration, but she's not going to be presidential material, whereas Nikki Haley, you know, people. People, this is another, like you mentioned, Trump's kind of affinity for his family and how that's kind of a double-edged sword in some cases. There's also an affinity just for anyone who tells him what he wants to hear at, at a given time and people kind of appeal to him in the right way, like on Fox and things. And Nikki Haley's actually a remarkable case because people forget this. During the campaign, she was selected to give like the rebuttal to his nomination speech. She gave like, she was of all people has chosen to give a kind of de facto rebuttal. In her remarks, she associated Donald Trump's position on immigration with Dylan Roof, the nut guy, the nut job who killed innocent people in a South Carolina church. She compared the president of the United States saying we don't want open borders to Dylan Roof, a mass murderer in, of, of church, innocent churchgoers. And yet somehow she ends up in the cabinet. And, you know, if people understand her, her political background, she comes out of the South Carolina political machine which is a deeply corrupt political machine. It's really, you know, there are things I, you know, shouldn't and just won't get into. But if you look at someone like Lindsey Graham as a senator and Tim Scott, there's some, you know, weird similarities there. Say, you know, how can you have both senators who are like this? But it's it's very weird. And Nikki Haley comes out of the same machine. She's joined at the hip with Lindsey Graham. When she was in the administration, I happen to know she was talking with Lindsey Graham all the time. And so you look at her network, she represents this kind of neoconservative, but I can understand she has some appeal. She's she's, you know, a woman. She represents you know, quote unquote, diversity, the new face, the new face of the Republican Party. It's the new face, but it's really the old ideas. And she absolutely represents the military industrial complex, neoconservatism. She went straight from the administration to some like fake sinecure at Boeing. Um, and so I can see the neocons kind of uh, coalescing around her and presenting her as someone who's like holding the torch of Trumpism. I can see neoconservatives like the Ben Shapiro type people, I can see them coalescing um, behind someone like Dan Crenshaw, who again, like has appeal, like he was a Navy SEAL. And so there's like appeal and people see that and they think it's great, but they don't necessarily understand like what the interests are behind that. So I yeah. see that as a faction. I see Rubio as an as another faction. This is interesting because there's been many, many reinventions of Rubio. And this is another illustration of how smart the neoconservatives are because the actual neoconservative in 2016 was not the Bush, it was Rubio. All of the Bush people were backing Rubio in 2016. Rubio's undergone another reinvention as someone who's like this, industrial policy conservative, which basically means like paying lip service to economic nationalism without committing to any of its specific proposals, being as deliberately vague as possible and just being really anti-China and that's you know about it. So Rubio's might make a play as the industrial policy guy. Hawley kind of occupies that space with a certain twist. Tom Cotton is like hardcore neocon foreign policy says the right things on domestic policy immigration. So that's the constellation. I, you know, I like 
Matt Gates, but I'm I'm biased because you know, I'm associated with him. But I I think he's tremendously talented politically, and he he's definitely he has a record of being someone who gets the Trump foreign policy. He's on record. He's even you know bucked the Trump administration sometimes on foreign policy. So and he's very effective on television, which is. Um, an essential asset. So, so that's kind of the the lay of the land as I see it, both in terms of people and the different kind of ideological camps and the masks that they're going to use to advance this. But I think as people like you, people like me, we need to get be ready on day one if Trump loses to get ahead of this narrative war because the other side is going to say Trump lost precisely for the reasons that we know he won. Trump lost because he was against open borders. Trump lost because he didn't bow to free trade. Trump lost because he irritated all the generals because he didn't want to stay in these forever wars. No. If Trump loses, which I don't think he will, I hope he won't. If he loses, it's because he gave these people too much say in the administration, not too little. Yeah, I was actually, that's the next thing I'll ask you about, but I do want to just touch on what you talked about with the dissonance between a lot of people on the right. Uh, the greatest example of this, I think, and I do, I like the Daily Wire. I think they have some very talented writers there, but Ben Shapiro, of course, was a never Trump conservative in 2016. He's come around recently for different reasons, but the dissonance of seeing people attend these speeches, uh, wearing the MAGA hat and then holding the leftist tears tumbler. I think is the greatest visual example of this, not really understanding the differences fundamentally between what those two emblems represent, I think is very dangerous uh, going forward. And so um, I did want to ask you about that, though, with his administration specifically, there were a lot of gaps and, and leaks and just general let's just say, unoptimal circumstances. And since you worked in that administration for a while, I was wondering if you could kind of touch on what exactly the dynamic was uh, within that. Right. Yeah, it was, um, you know, I joked about this anonymous figure who recently unmasked himself as <laughs> some, some non-entity, you know, nobody's heard of him. I hadn't heard of him. Uh, just this complete non-entity who's angling, you know, to his credit, like he, it is a good little scam he ran like he now he's on cnn and he'll probably get a book deal but you know the idea of this guy as you know senior administration official whatever it's absurd and what's what's even more funny is he listed all of these things which are in every likelihood just lies about oh look at these horrible things that trump suggested they're basically all great and just like you know make you love him even more it's like oh yo trump was that that tweet thread Yes. <laughs> yeah. All those are just spot on. <laughs> it was all great stuff. He's like, aren't you aren't you appalled by all these things? They know it's actually I wish you were that was actually true. <laughs> I wish that was true. But yeah, um, you have people like that. You had a personnel issue from the very beginning. I think it was again, it's like people need to understand this is a dynamic that persists is you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I voted for Trump because I couldn't stand Hillary. That's, you know, that's great. That's most people, frankly, you know, most people. But there's sort of the core group, the, you know, the frontline group who attached to him in the early primary, who got what made him different, what made him special and what ultimately set him up to win. And it wasn't that he wasn't Hillary, is that he was a different kind of guy from the typical fare that you get from the Republican Party. And just to, and I was one of the very early supporters of Trump. I got much, much more hate from people who made their living off of conservatism than I did from anyone on the left. Because Trump was a threat to people who made their living off of conservatism because he was just entirely new. He wasn't beholden to them and so forth. And um, for that reason, he ran against the Republican Party just as much as anything else. And that didn't stop when he got into office. And so by giving the RNC and Reince Priebus so much authority over personnel, he really kind of shot himself in the foot as so far as implement his, in, implementing his agenda. And even the people that he's put in, it's like, and they're good. You know, a lot of these are good people that I like personally. I don't think they're even malicious in any way. But like you look at somebody even like Larry Kudlow, who in the grand scheme of things isn't even one of the bad ones. But here's a guy who's like a television economist. He's not like even a real economist. He's a television economist. He's most closely associated with 
defending George W. Bush and saying there's no problem with the housing market like months before the mortgage crash and being an absolute vociferous uh, uh, defender of free trade orthodoxy that Trump ran against. And he brought in his you know cadre of mediocrities, people like Steve Moore and others. And it's just like they're good people, but they don't have what I call the software updates. They don't have the software updates. They're living in this old, they think it's you know 1980 constantly, and they're just not able to effectively implement. And I'm using them not to criticize because I don't think they're saboteurs. I just don't think they have the software updates. There are actual saboteurs that were brought in as well. And people like Anonymous, but also people, also others. And so there's this severe personnel error from the very beginning in giving the RNC and all these people who basically were, their attitude toward the Trump phenomenon wasn't really that distant from that of Peter Strzok, to be honest. And, but, uh, and he gives them, you know, almost carte blanche over, over personnel. And then of course there's the family issue, but that's separate. Family issue is understandable, even if it's not optimal. The RNC issue was completely an unforced error that had tremendously damaging effects going forward. And one just specific example of this is a guy called Mark Short, who was the legislative uh, affair, head of legislative affairs during that first that early period, basically his job was to negotiate Trump's legislative agenda to Paul Ryan, who was the speaker at the time. He was completely aligned with Paul Ryan. He had no interest in lobbying for what you know the president's agenda might have been, should have been very early on. And there you know, they dumped all the political capital, first of all, on you know, all these conservatives have been whining about health care. Yep. They finally get their chance to do it. They screw that up. And then their next chance is, oh, let's let's burn what political capital we have left on tax cuts. You know, and that's not what the 2016 was set up to do. They could have done tax cuts later. So so it was a problem from the very beginning, and it's a problem that I associate to a large degree with the Republican Party itself, which continues, by the way, to sabotage him in subtle and not so subtle ways. Um, Mitch McConnell, I happen to know, has told many people privately that his posture toward Trump, is he doesn't like Trump. He wants to undermine Trump. He doesn't necessarily even want Trump to win. And his attitude toward navigating the Trump era is to you know, kind of thwart or, or stall everything except for judges. So, and that, that, yeah, that's just what you have. What do you think about the, the moves that he's been taking recently that could potentially and hopefully uh, sort of purge that opposition from his, his next administration and make it more authentic to what the 2016 administration should have been? Mm-hmm. I think those are great. You know, I, I think there's a lot of great stuff happening on the personnel side, but, you know, it's, it's a question of, whether it's too late, um, you know, but but I, I see things on a very positive trajectory and an especially positive trajectory, incidentally, as it comes to the people who are capable of dealing with big tech censorship. Finally, you know, the right people are being kind of um, positioned in the FCC and other relevant agencies, people who have the intelligence and the um, orientation to actually get something done there. So that's probably where I'm most optimistic about things if Trump wins. But if Trump has a second term, um, I'm optimistic about personnel uh, because I think they are kind of effectively shoring it up. But again, it's it's it would have been nice to do that like three years ago, four years ago. Yeah. One thing I'm also glad that you touched on that I've tried to also communicate is that uh, we tend to, because we operate so consistently from the framework of, of not playing for keeps, but just playing. We like to sort of win the election and then gloat about it without understanding the longer term implications. And uh, I, I try to communicate to people quite often that literally this is something that we'll be fighting for the rest of our lives. Like this is not something that we could fix overnight. So like you mentioned with the stage one and then the stage three and four and stuff. So again, not to put you on the spot, but what are some things that you think that the audience watching could really uh, attach themselves to so that they're equipped to, to be 
ready for that fight in the future, specifically the civil war that we're going to face when Trump gets out of office, whether that's this January or four years from now, um, that, that are fundamentally conservative and, and are authentic and would be, um, I guess, the most effective principles with to align themselves to that could kind of like help propagate in the future. Right. Well, I think, you know, the principles part is in some ways the easy part for the younger people. Like the younger people aren't, you know, getting into, unless they're like at Hillsdale and their goal is to like be a legislative aide to like Mitch McConnell or whatever, they're not, young people are not introduced into politics by reading dusted off copies of the National Review. You know, young people are getting their entree into politics from the internet, from people like you, from people like others who, you know, just kind of um, are not part of that old, you know, kind of anachronistic conservative, but represent kind of a more America first point of view. And um, I think that resonates a lot with younger people. So I think the principles and orientations are not so much the problem as just people knowing what to do. And again, it's like, you don't want to focus so much on ideas. We all, you know, the younger people, like if they're, if they're getting material online, they're going to kind of absorb the relevant facts as it were. And the question is, what do you do with that? Do you come out overtly as a political person? That's not always the best idea because there are personal repercussions. And it's great if you're positioned to do that, but you don't have to. And I think what we need is start, you know, building out an infrastructure. We need great programmers. We need people who are great in IT. We need great pe people who are great entrepreneurs. We are, need people in every different sector and build up a kind of infrastructure for cross networking, cross pollin pollination. If I would love to set up like a fellowship for young, talented people in IT, like, you know, there's a computer science Olympiad, like there is a math Olympiad, get a computer science Olympiad, find the most natively talented people, people really good in computer science or high school age. And, you know, the top, say, 50, fly them out somewhere, just hang out, build camaraderie. And, you know, you vet the 50 for people who are you know going to be receptive. But then you bring people, you just maybe have some discussions, maybe have them watch some of your videos, discuss them, just build the start of a little network with these people. And they have other people they can talk going forward and do that for every sector, do that for finance, do that for academia, do that for everything and um, do that for journalism. You know, th that kind of thinking, there's, I think another thing is not only is there an inordinate attention to ideas per se, there's an inordinate attention to the importance of winning elections, where there's so much that can be done on the kind of infrastructure network building level that really needs to be done. And really winning elections isn't going to be as much of a force multiplier until you have that infrastructure in place. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times when people ask me about what the next move is, they're, they're really expecting and hoping for a, a very simple answer that doesn't necessitate that they get on a plane and they go network with people and they, they sort of build that infrastructure, like you said. Um, but I think really what it comes down to, and I'm sure you'd agree, is literally just making yourself into the most competent and frankly, powerful person possible, and then being able to mobilize in, in those positions. Um, and I guess to better articulate what I was asking, wasn't necessarily, you know, which principles to, to align oneself with, but what would the red flags be, I guess, during these civil wars when the people start to emerge and talk about, well, let's just make sure that Trumpism never happens again. You know, that was a mistake. We can all move forward. Things like that, not only from the left, but what are some red flags that you'd think or would expect people on the right, uh, I guess, nominally to, to sort of right. put Right. Or you're going to have, I mean, you're going to have the never Trump types who are going to say, basically, this is all assuming that Trump loses. So we'll see. But if, if Trump loses, you're going to have your never Trump types who say, look, this was just a nightmarish aberration. And now it's back to responsible conservatism for, you know, in the service of um, 
you know, Lockheed Martin or something like that, that that's, that's what they're going to advocate, but it's not going to have resonance because there really is such a, you know, call it whatever you want. You can call it a cult of personality. There's, there's a tremendous enthusiasm and attachment to the person and persona of Trump himself. And so even now, you know, people are kind of, whether they like it or not, have to, in order to be effective, formulate everything as, oh, this is what I happen to like. Oh, but what I happen to like is actually the proper interpretation of of Trump, right? There's like a necessity to do that. I think that necessity will diminish a little bit, but it won't go away entirely due to the kind of cult of personality issue and his, I would expect, continued relevance within politics. And so, um, the the never Trump approach of oh Trump is just an aberration. I think that'll be limited effectiveness. I think the real battle is going to be for what is the actual meaning of Trumpism, and that's where you're going to see the other side say, look, Nikki Haley is the great new face of Trumpism. Nikki Haley, you know, Tim Scott, all these people who are you know kind of dressed up in this clothing and can you. Know, show you their CV and be like, oh, look, I was a Trump cabinet official. What are you talking about? But really represent interests that are completely antithetical to those that Trump uh, ran on. And so that's what you're going to see. And so I think that's the more dangerous and more difficult kind of narrative battle to say, no, what Trumpism actually means is, you know, foreign policy restraint, um, you know, uh, 21st century immigration rationalism, you know, not open borders and kind of, you know, trade economic policies generally that oriented toward American people. And then you can build on that because, frankly, those three issues, you know, we don't want to have Pat Buchanan, for instance, turn into another Reagan in terms of like clinging to issue because it's a very dynamic environment. There are a lot of other things that are going to be important, too. But that basic kind of essence of it is what you know should kind of form the core of what whatever comes next in the phases would be about. Yeah, that's what's really pernicious about these uh, these new GOP actors is the only things that they change or that have changed are are the faces, basically just being less male and and less white and, and less Christian. But then also they just basically like they learned how to format Instagram ads, and so they think right. that. I have flag, I have music. I am. I don't know if I, I want to call this person out specifically, but no. I would, Alex Clark with Poplitics. Alex Clark with Poplitics, T P O S A. Yeah, <laughs> she did something. And she like the Instagram story was her dancing to Cardi B, and, and basically it was like the most provocative and degenerate dance like I've ever seen. And she's like, very, <laughs> "This is how we take back the culture." You know, we get right. all these. It's just so so sad. It's so pathetic. But yeah, Madison yeah. Cawthon put out yeah. an op-ed on, on the Daily Wire about you know the future of the American right, and I was excited about him when when he first got uh, you know he he secured the the the, the nomination uh, in the primary because you know he's a young guy. He said that he was in line with Trump's agenda, and then you're reading you know his prescription for the future of the American right, and it sounds like Paul Ryan, except like right. a little bit more willing to acknowledge the issue of climate change or things like that. And so really what it is, is just like, we're really going to stand our ground on, on economic issues, but we'll gradually shift over and embrace the, the left's moral paradigm on social issues, which right. again, divide is much less consequential with economic issues. And really it's issues of, of identity and social issues that are really going to define, I think, uh, the future of the country. But do you have any, any final thoughts, Dr. Beatty? My final thoughts, I don't know. I think it's going to be a big fight. I think the this narrative battle is going to be huge for us. And, and it's like I said, either way, the narrative battle is it's up to you. It's up. It's up to me to some extent. It's up to and probably a lot of people listening. It's our responsibility to shape the narratives that will determine what the next phase is. And that's irrespective of what the outcome of the election, if Trump wins, that's great. That gives us maybe a little bit more time. But in any case, it's, you know, this is playing for keeps. This is playing for all the marbles. How are things going to shape up? What's the 21st century going to look like? Are we going to have a competitive and real opposition to this poisonous monolith that's emerged as the defining feature of this new American dystopia? Will we be able to build a robust and real opposition to this that isn't stupid, corrupt, weak? 
or is it going to be the same old fake charade? And that will be decided by, you know, people like you, people like me, people like others who decide, yes, this is worth playing for keeps. And uh, the first step in that is seizing the narrative and saying, this is exactly why things happen the way that they happen and moving forward from there. Absolutely. Brilliantly said. And and I guess that would be the, the quintessential message would be that uh, understanding that the narrative is always going to exist. And for the last hundred years in this country, the American right has, has adopted the position of, like you said, don't tread on me. And we just will agree to not try to impose our narrative on you, but really understanding that 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 power vacuum can't exist. Someone will try to fill it. And understanding that the reason every policy discussion in this country is always whatever we have established and then a little bit more left. Like, can you imagine a country where we were arguing in favor of like, no, what if we could actually two day ship guns from Amazon Prime or like really moving things Things in literally the right direction politically of this country would be great, but that hasn't happened because we're weak, stupid, or corrupt. We have not adopted that sort of moral imperialism of like, yes, we know we're correct, and we're going to actually try to impose that on you because we know what's good for the country. We know what's good for the American people, and so we're going to literally dedicate our lives to achieving that. So that's epic. Very excited about that. Very high IQ, high energy. I'm glad that we had this conversation. Can you tell people where to find you? Um, you can find me at Twitter at at Darren J. Beattie, D-A-R-R-E-N-J-B-E-A-T-T-I-E. And you can find me at the president's endorsed favorite alternative to Drudge. That's where all the color revolution stuff comes from. Just follow the site revolver.news. And if you have um, boomer parents, for the young people watching, your boomer parents, they'll love revolver.news as well. It's friendly to all all stripes. So check that out, bookmark it. Um, and I, I'm very confident you'll like it. So revolver.news and my Twitter are the best places to go. That That's completely true. Um, everyone's probably familiar with the Drudge Report, but they've become so antithetical to, to what the principles upon which they were founded. And Revolver, not only to, to, to continue to, to speak greatly, that it not only uh, aggregates news. So, you know, maybe you don't know where to find your news, go to Revolver, uh, or they even commission studies. Like one of the most brilliant things and useful things to ever come out in the last year, I think, was the study that was commissioned by Revolver on, on the yeah. impact that the lockdowns had. Oh, I, I, if I could just say some stuff about yeah. that. Really, that's really important. And you're and I'm really, really proud of this. This is, you know, Re- Revolver. You know, I, what I like about Revolver it is it does kind of combine the the highbrow and the lowbrow. We have some really sophisticated stuff and we have like fun aggregation stuff that's sort of politically oriented. And this particular commission piece um, three you know, PhDs, very competent in, in economics, um, who did a study that's actually, despite their, um, you know, sophisticated credentials, the actual study was quite simple. And the study was this. We heard all of this framing from the other side that, oh, we're not going to, you know, sacrifice lives to the economy. If it's just a matter of saving one more life from COVID, we're going to shut down the economy indefinitely. And this just makes the case in a rigorous um, uh, kind of quantitative fashion that you cannot separate people's lives from their livelihoods, that there are demonstrable health effects to economic suffering. And it draws upon the pre-existing economic literature of what are the expected health effects, what are the expected deaths from any delta increase in unemployment. And it puts all those pieces together and say, look, from all these lockdowns, we're ending up, you know, ruining a lot more people's lives than we are saving. And, you know, it's the president, I know for a fact, read that study. It's been reflected in his vocabulary. He tweeted it. Several congressmen tweeted it. It's had a real impact on the conversation. And the real kind of scandal is that, you know, and I, you know, I love Revolver News. The real scandal is no one else had done this. And the and the people involved in the study who had to publish it under pseudonyms for fear of retaliation within their prospective positions, including in academia, in terms of getting more grant money and all this, there's all kinds of retaliation and professional pressure if you deviate from the COVID narrative. But it's a scandal that nobody had done this. And this is like the most monumental public policy decision made maybe ever. It's simply unprecedented to shut down the entire economy indefinitely over a disease, let alone a disease 
whose victims average age is higher than the age of life expectancy. We didn't even shut down due to the 1918 epidemic. whose average age of fatality was 28. COVID's average age is like 80, 79. And we shut down the entire economy. So, you know, this is a, another conversation. I think it's, you know, maybe one of the greatest crimes against humanity. It is absolute public policy travesty, the effects of which we're only beginning to see. And I'm very proud of this study on Revolver that just goes through all you know, the literature and says, look, the lockdowns themselves are 10 times more deadly than the disease. And that's taking into account generously all of the reported statistics. So if you're actually, I think it's actually worse than that, but we, for the sake of argument, took for granted all the numbers that the government had in terms of how many COVID deaths there were and so forth. But it's it's an absolute scandal and it's, it's just deeply depressing. I, I don't think most people have like the psychological fortitude to truly look into the face, the magnitude of this crime against the people for nothing. Yeah, absolutely. I remember when I first came across that study on Revolver, I was so excited. I mean, not excited in, in, in an elated sense, but I was so happy that someone had done that because it is such a useful piece of information to be able to present. And so um, I guess speaking broadly to the audience, creating narratives or contributing to the narratives, contributing anything, whether you know, it's commissioning studies like that, things like with what Revolver's doing, commentary channels, not to pat myself on the back, but like doing something and putting your name right. and out there and then bringing other people's names and faces into it. Um, you know, anonymous Twitter accounts are great. Consuming information is great, but ultimately, whether that's monetarily or or like structurally, everyone's going to have to contribute something and, and make it broadly speaking, like the, their life's goal, if they're really passionate about this country and its future. So Dr. Beatty, very glad to have you. I think it was a great discussion and uh, we'll do it again sometime. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Of course. So with that, here we are. Election day is tomorrow. Very excited. Make sure you get your three people to go with you to vote. The undecideds, the people that are maybe leaning Biden. But uh, we will see what happens. It's going to be very epic. Very excited for the future. We're optimistic. We're optimistic on a lot of things, not only this channel's future. But I mean, if there were ever a plan or a, a means by which we could take back the country and get it in a positive trajectory, uh, Dr. Beatty is going to be one of the leading architects in that. So be sure to go check him out on Twitter. Be sure to go to revolver.news. That's where I that's where I get my news. People are like, where do you get your news? Revolve. I mean, it saves me a lot of time. But anyways, thank you so much for watching and we will see you next time.